we can change the behaviors that are causing the problem. I think that this government has got the environmental conscience of Attila the Hun. I will not accept a plan that will harm our economy and hurt American workers. We are in a battle for a future for our children and grandchildren. Decades of debate while oil continues to burn. Environmental movements, lawsuits, conferences, agreements, as we continue to damage our atmosphere. Scientists warning us there will be consequences if we don't act quickly and drastically. I became involved in, in climate and environmental policy in the late 80s first, and I am very frustrated by how slow it's been to get real action on cutting emissions. The reality is the glaciers are melting faster than the political momentum is building on climate change. That's just the reality. In the wake of this reality, some scientists have been working on a supplementary approach with a totally different philosophy. If human beings are going to impact the environment, why not impact with intention? How? Well, there are some crazy ideas. What if we refroze the Arctic? or suck carbon out of the air? What if we chemically reverse the acidification of our oceans? Or block the sun's rays with big mirrors in space or man-made clouds? The technical term for manipulating the climate is geoengineering. It's a growing field. In fact, it's growing beyond the scientific laboratories and into other areas like policy and law. And some of the biggest players are right here in North America. Now, one of the more controversial streams of this is called solar radiation management, or solar geoengineering. And before we understand the impacts this technology might have on our entire planet, we need to understand how it works and just how big the stakes really are. Solar geoengineering is one approach that's received a lot of attention, which is creating a sunscreen, limiting how much sun gets through our atmosphere. Welcome to Boston, local time 515. To learn how it works, the best place to go is Harvard University. The first thing you guys do. Canadian scientist David Keith is the leading expert in solar geoengineering. So I think I need to look at a more accurate geometry of what's happening. His team of atmospheric scientists is trying to determine if there's a responsible, feasible way to filter out sunlight by spreading fine particles like sulfur in the atmosphere. How do you get a million tons of sulfur up into the highest reaches of our atmosphere? So that turns out probably not to be that hard. So first of all, let's put a million tons in context. So the world now dumps about 50 million tons of sulfur into the lower atmosphere as a pollutant, and it kills several million people a year. Uh, so that's the scale of, of the way we're already altering the global sulfur cycle by air pollution, burning fossil fuels. The idea is to scatter the particles high in the stratosphere, supposedly out of harm's reach, using a fleet of high-altitude aircraft at a cost of a few billion dollars a year. Lots of sunlight would still get through, but through a controlled quantity, it could reflect just enough to alter global temperatures. The concept has been proven to work by Mother Nature, with massive volcanoes that have injected sulfur particles into the atmosphere and actually temporarily decreased global temperatures. But the bigger question is, can we do it without negative impacts? My view is that it's by no means clear that we definitely want to do this. I think it's nonsense to claim we have to do it. But I think knowing more about something that potentially is really useful for reducing climate risks is very important. And I think that the idea that we should have a taboo and kind of close our eyes and ears is really dangerous. And we make better decisions in the sunlight when we can see what's going on. Well, that's one scientific approach to geoengineering, but it has issues and not everyone agrees it should be done at all. Thank you for flying with us today. In Ottawa, 
Pat Mooney has been studying the field as it develops. He's executive director of ETC Group, an organization that looks at how new technologies can impact the environment. Mr. Mooney. Yes, Bob Hi. McDonald. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Thank you so Good much for giving you. us your time. No really problem. Glad it. to do it. Let's Thanks. have a seat right here on the bench. Okay. Great. So, what are your concerns if geoengineering was to go ahead? Well, it, it, there's so many uncertainties with it. Uh, it assumes a knowledge of how our, our planet works that we don't have. Just think that what would happen if, in the middle of blowing sulfates into the stratosphere, that we discover uh, a volcano erupts like it did in Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, we'd suddenly find ourselves not with a temperature decline that we thought we could manage of two degrees perhaps, but perhaps a decline of four degrees, which could be disastrous for us. So we're learning these things about our planet all the time, and the biology of the planet, the structure of the planet, and to try to do these kinds of huge planetary adjustments without that knowledge is quite scary. The scientific argument is that we need to do the research now so that if we do come to a desperate situation, at least we will have done that sure, research. Sure, yeah. Then we'll know what to do. What's your reaction to that? Um, there's two kinds of reactions. One is that the research always seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger because you can't learn anything at a small scale. The other major danger, we believe, is that it, it gives governments who have shown themselves to be remarkably effective at getting themselves off the hook of kicking the can down the road and not doing anything themselves are given another excuse. They're told, or able to say, well folks, we have this backup plan, so don't worry. You know, if we have another Hurricane Katrina or a Hurricane Harvey or whatever, Irma, don't worry, we'll take care of that for you, we, we have a plan. And that means that they don't then have to do the hard work now of cutting back in greenhouse gas emissions and, and getting ourselves ready for what's going to be a hotter planet. It's part of the appeal of geoengineering, a seemingly feasible solution to a daunting and desperate situation. It's almost like when you have someone who's uh, got a terminal illness and they're in the final phases and say, well, would you like to try this experimental drug? Sure. It may have side effects that are worse than the disease, but what have you got to lose? Yeah, yeah. Are, are, I mean, could we get into that situation with the planet where it's become so hot? We'll try anything. Oh, sure. That, that, that's certainly the case. Uh, when, which is a reason to encourage more research uh, on all of our planetary systems to understand how best we, what our flexibilities are and our options are, and more hard work, of course, in cutting back on the emissions as fast as we can. But, but uh, I mean, if you're a patient, you're willing to trust the doctor. In this case, you've got to trust a politician. In New York, there's a group calling on world leaders to plan ahead. Our organization was just created this year, and what we're trying to do is shift the conversation that's taking place among the scientific research community and move it into the policy sphere, because most policymakers really don't know anything, if at all, about geoengineering. Ms. Scharf, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Cynthia Scharf was formerly the UN Secretary General's chief speechwriter on climate change. She's now... Senior Strategy Director at the Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, C2G2 for short. Why do we need your organization? This conversation is too important, um, potentially too dangerous to leave to just the scientific community. These technologies have planetary-wide impacts. They will affect not just our generation, but generations to come for hundreds of years. This is a global conversation. It's an intergenerational conversation. And we need to have it now because we are at a very dangerous point in terms of options. Um, our role is impartial. Our job is to say, this is coming be aware of it. Here are some issues that you might want to consider, maybe having some kind of an international hold on solar geoengineering, or looking at some guidelines, some governance of how we research and do testing of these geoengineering technologies, or what kind of national legislation might we need on removing carbon from the atmosphere. Why do you think the conversation with the politicians and the other social organizations is only happening now? Um, it's clear that even though the world has the Paris Agreement on climate change, we are still very, very far from where we need to be 
in terms of reducing global emissions and keeping our planet um, at a safe level under 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees. Um, the gap there is enormous and very, very worrying. Um, that is why there is increasing interest in the scientific community to talk about some of these technologies. According to a group called Climate Interactive, the current pledges to the Paris Agreement still mean a global temperature increase of 3.3 degrees over pre-industrial levels by the year 2100. And that figure already includes some carbon removal techniques. So could it be that something like solar geoengineering is needed, even if we do reduce emissions? Back at Harvard, that question keeps David Keith focused on his research with plans to do a real-world experiment 20 kilometers into the atmosphere in the coming year. It almost seems like an end-of-pipe solution, though, that it would be more sensible to focus on going back to the source of the problem. That, that's exactly the right question, because you, you're using some manipulation, some pollution to fight some other pollution, and the right question is, why on earth shouldn't we just stop putting CO2 out? The long-run answer is, of course, yes. In the long run, if we want to deal with the climate problem, we must bring global carbon emissions to zero. So in my view, solar geoengineering can never be a substitute for cutting emissions, but it could be a supplement to cutting emissions. The combination of emissions cuts in solar geo might be a safer world with less environmental disruption and less great storms that hurt some of the poorest people in the world than a world where we just cut emissions. For more than 200 years, humans have been pushing the climate by adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And there have been unexpected consequences beyond a warming planet. Storms are getting stronger. There's ocean acidification. Coral reefs around the world are bleaching. Are we willing to risk unexpected consequences of geoengineering? Or could we avoid a catastrophic climate crisis without it? For The National, I'm Bob McDonald.